This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Greetings, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for this very special installment of the Scars and Guitars podcast. This is the video edition of a conversation that has been available since September 2021 featuring David Anderson of Soilwork and Nightflight Orchestra fame. We received very, very sad news on the 14th of September that David had passed away at the age of 47. So what I'm doing here is honoring the great man by releasing this video version of the conversation because I think it's worthwhile. Throughout this chat here, we cover a lot of ground. How he joined Soilwork and his relationship with Bjorn Speed Strid. Why the lads have forged the Night Flight Orchestra. If you're unfamiliar, that's a project which focuses on AOR and music which would typically not be associated with heavy metal but is nonetheless very worthwhile. It's a joy in this chat to dive into what is truly his magnum opus, A Wisp of the Atlantic. It's one of the finest collection of tunes under the Soilwork banner and it is David's brainchild. So you'll hear all about his thoughts on that particular release. Now, there's a moment in this chat where Bjorn actually calls David and he answers and he puts him on speaker and Bjorn and I were able to have a quick exchange about the late great Ralph Santola. That was a very interesting moment, it must be said, especially given what has transpired since. Elsewhere in the chat, we discuss David's role as a medical professional. So this guy, hyper intelligent, but extremely talented. He was able to make use of his intelligence. Not just a great guitarist, an exceptional songwriter, a medical professional with a specialty in the realm of irritable bowel syndrome disorders and diseases. And I share my journey with him as a sufferer of severe ulcerative colitis. So that's that's a unique exchange, that one there indeed. And finally, and sadly, David talks about events that led to a recent mental health episode. So just keep in mind that this chat happened in September of 2021. It's a joy to hear him talk about so many topics, but it's also very sad that such a gifted soul is no longer among us. Either way, here he is, David Anderson. I hope you enjoy listening and watching this chat with the great man. Let's go. Hey, mate, how's things? Hello. How are you going? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, you, you were early. <laughs> it's well, normally... Yeah. It's normally the opposite way, but uh, I understand you're not just strictly a musician either. So <laughs> must be the, the the dutifulness of your role as a. Uh, are you a GP or are you a specialist? Uh, I'm a specialist in um, gastroenterology. Oh wow! I've got uh, ulcerative colitis. Oh, you do. Uh, that's yeah. my specialty. I'm, I'm like my uh, my main. I work mostly with IBD. Wow. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, gosh. The stories I could tell. Yeah. It actually stopped me from doing it. <laughs> Perhaps just, we should do another interview about that as well. Well, <laughs> yeah. just, it, it it forced me. But, but it, like, it's my, it's my special sort of like sub specialty. I, I, I mean, um, I, yeah, I mostly work with IBD and, you know, both treatment and endoscopies and, you know, everything. Mm. Yeah. Are you based in the UK or are you in Sweden? Well, Sweden right now. I'm I'm um, I'm in England right now visiting my girlfriend, um, having some time off. But yeah, but I work in Sweden, and we all live in Sweden. But yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Well, look, I'll get to the music, and maybe we can thread some of that other stuff in between because I know a lot of people suffer from from IBD related issues, yeah, from Crohn's right. through to colitis, and um, yeah, I had a heck of a bloody awful time with it, to be quite honest with you. And you're someone who knows. Yeah. More than just about yeah. anybody else about it. So, but uh, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that because the reason we've actually connected is to talk about. I thought it might have been to talk about uh, the soil work EP, Wisp of the Atlantic, but because uh, you can get an opportunity to chat with yourself or street through that one there. But it's not, it's cool. It's Night Flight Orchestra. Yeah, what, but what we, can, we, can do, we, can, we can do both. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm in both bands, so, so I mean, it doesn't have to be strictly about one thing. I'm, I'm happy to chat about whatever you want to talk about. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, look, I've had many conversations with Bjorn over the years and such as the the rate of releases that you guys do. I don't know where you guys collectively find the time to fit everything in, but you're obviously extremely productive people, smart people and productive people. But, um, look, it's a pleasure to get the opportunity to finally chat to you because uh, yeah. long-time fan of soil work, it's got to be said, and I've made that jump over to Night Flight Orchestra way back when the first Aeromantic album, was it, was that the first album that came out? Was it Aeromantic? Sorry, I should have done some research. Uh, I mean, yeah, Aromantic was the last album. Aromantic was number five, and, and this uh, new album, Aromantic 2, that comes out today is number six, I guess. Six, yeah. it's. I think I've had probably, there was a, a period of time there where I was having two conversations a year with, with uh, Bjorn. One of them... Yeah was on the eve of Ralph Santola passing away. And I know he and Ralph Santola oh, were very good mates. That was a hell of a conversation, that one, because I yeah. didn't know Ralph, but I'd interviewed him and we'd got to sort of, you know, you do the email exchange thing afterwards. I met him a couple of times and, and I know, I mean, I wasn't really friends with him per se, but I mean, I met him a couple of times and he was really, really fun guy, really smart, talented. And I guess he had his demons as well, but, you know. Something, something though, too, though, which I think is a bit of a lesson for people these days, given how fractured society is. But, um, you know, he's known for having fairly right-wing views and Bjorn is known for having fairly left-wing views, yet they're all very good friends. And yeah. that's, that's something that you just don't see a lot of these days, unfortunately. It's so bloody polarised out there, isn't it? But, uh, yeah. look, I'm, I'm sort of getting a bit off track, I suppose, from from the album. <laughs> here, but, but, look, it's I don't do that. I, I, I like the, you know... Um, I, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I like doing interviews and I, I will, I especially like it when, you know, you can go off and, you know. That's definitely talk me about then. <laughs> other things, because that's, you know, that's what, at the end of the day, that's what, what's important. I mean, um, to me, like music is, it's um, something very personal and magical in a way. I'm very far removed from the cynical, you know, person a cynical person just doing it for like as a sort of, sort of like business or to pay the rent i mean if you know that's supposed to be you know special <laughs> and and what makes it special is usually the stuff around the music as well not just like oh how did you what guitar amp did you use for that or like <laughs> oh god yeah uh, you know. yeah yeah, I've had some of those interviews, but they're when they're like Marcus Jadel. You might know Marcus. He's a Swede, of course, um, a Vitarium. I mean, a guy like him, you go there because he's one of those guitar aficionados, isn't he? He's like a Blackmore type guy, isn't he? You know, and yeah, where, yeah. It's, where it's appropriate to go there, I didn't think, I didn't organize a whole bunch of questions around gear and guitars um, sure. for you just because I didn't, I did, you know, I listened to some of your other interviews and it just, I don't know, sometimes you just get a vibe whether or not something's going to fit or not. But, but I do like, I love what you guys have been doing for, for a while now from the perspective that you're giving people another opportunity to get into your musical universe. It's not just about yeah, yeah. the metal. It is about what have I written here? Think Go West meets Ultimate Sin Era Aussie meets late 80s FM pop. There you go. That's how I summarise Night Flight Orchestra. Uh, <laughs> I know you guys have done Rod Stewart covers and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, yeah. But what is it about you guys, you know, yourself, Bjorn, and the rest of the lads in the band that you can have these such a productive life outside of music and then when you get together, you're releasing up to two albums a year? Yeah, uh, I, I guess um, it's because we still enjoy it. I mean, I mean to me... Uh, uh, even if I've been doing, I mean, I've been playing music for a very long time and on a professional level, and but at the same time, it still doesn't feel like work. I still do it because I enjoy it. And, and uh, you know, I write songs almost every day because I love writing songs and I listen to music and I read about music and I read, you know, um, uh, um, Whereas I, I know a lot of my colleagues in the business who are like, uh, you know, they do it just because they, they don't, they can't really do anything else and they need to continue to be able yeah. to, you know, and, and, you know, and I know bands were like, you know, they don't talk to each other, they don't do it because they have to. And, and whereas both with Nightfight Orchestra and Solar Work, we're still friends, we still keep in touch all the time and, and you know, discuss music and all kinds of other things. And, and 
you know, and, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to play music that I really like, where people I really like and enjoy playing with. And, and I guess that's why, you know, if I'd hated everyone in the band and, <laughs> and if, if I felt like, oh, I really want to play this and this, but I have to do this crap instead, then it probably would have been hard. But, you know, it's, it's you know, for us, it's still, it's always fun to get together and play music and, and uh, you know, and I guess that's why we're, it's easy to be, to be, um, you know, productive if it's, if it doesn't feel like, you know, work. <laughs> True. But, uh, you know, there are people that can, they, uh, they love playing the guitar, but they don't come up with a quality that you guys are coming up with um, and consistent quality. So do, do you have to, Take a. I mean, obviously, you had, there's a. There will be a change in mindset, but how much of a change in mindset do you adopt if you're writing material for Night Flight Orchestra and soil work? I mean, not much, really. Um, of course, with with soil work, you have to. You know, it still has to be some kind of metal. I mean, it still has to be within some sort of metal context. Hmm. Whereas with, with Night Flight, you can do pretty much whatever you want except for metal, you know, and, and, um, um, but to me, it's, it's still, you know, the older I get, the less I care about genres. To me, it's all, it's all music. Of course, I'm aware of what genre different things are in, but when I listen to music, I mean, um, um, I don't really, I mean, the things I listen to these days, it's when I listen to music myself, it's usually either, you know, black metal or jazz or, you know, introverted awesome. Swedish pop. <laughs> mm. um, and, and, um, and as for songwriting, I mean, uh, songwriting is, it's, it's, you know, it's some, just like another instrument or it's a skill. Like you, you can't really, even if you're, you can be like the best guitar player in the world, but you can't really expect yourself to just come up with a song if you haven't done it before. I mean, I've been writing songs since I was like, I started my first band when I was like 13. Hmm. And like I started playing guitar when I was nine. And the first thing I did, like pretty much is when I started being able to, you know, <laughs> play a few notes, I started writing my own crappy riffs. <laughs> And I started writing cheesy lyrics about werewolves and what have you. <laughs> but it's always, you know, it's it's always been, you know, I, I grew up listening to what the thing that first got me into music when I was like five years old was my mom's record collection. She had like all the Beatles albums and Rolling Stones and, you know, Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix right. and mm -hmm. classic English pop singles like with the Kinks and, and, and uh, Chicory Tip and what have you. And, and uh, so I guess for me, it's always been about songwriting i mean of course i spent a fair amount of time trying to learn how to play guitar as well but uh, but I'm, i mean it's always been i'm crap but you know i've never learned you know a lot of people spend a lot of time you know learning every ingui solo or you know steve Vai solo and i've always been crap at that because i have my attention span is too short and i always end up writing my own stuff instead <laughs> you know so for me songwriting is always but it's it's a skill you have to you know um, it sounds like I'm I'm um, I'm full of myself right now. But I mean, just to answer your question, oh, no, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've never been. I still see myself as a songwriter who happens to play the guitar, mm -hmm. because I've always been writing songs, and it's to me the melody and, and the song has always been the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I love you know playing shred guitar, and you know. <laughs> I love playing the guitar, but but it's it's um, if I can't do it in a in a context that I'm happy with, I you know I'd rather play nice write nice songs than than, than just play um, shred guitar. But I I mean I'm fortunate I'm fortunate enough to be able to do both, and that's lovely. <laughs> well, you're good at it, mate. So yeah, there's no no um, you know. Nothing, no arrogance in your statement there whatsoever from the perspective that um, soil work, you've been doing what you do with soil work now for, for a long time. You're, you know, you're, a, you're a household name amongst extreme metal aficionados such as myself, have been for quite some time there. But um, with, 
with Night Flight Orchestra, I, I don't know. I can't remember if I asked you on this question years ago, but what was the the inspiration, the why? You know, you're playing extreme metal, heavy metal over here. Why did you decide to go down that direction? Um, well, it's it started. I mean, I, I did my first um, solo work tour. Uh, I did a US tour with them back in 2006 as a session guitarist. It was like after Peter first left the band, the old guitarist. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I didn't know them at all. They were like they were posting an ad or something. And I was like, I was at the time I was a PhD student and had lots of time on my hands. And <laughs> um, they were like, oh, look for a guitarist for our upcoming US tour. And it's like I went for an audition. I never met them before, and I went there, and you know, they. Um, they liked, but they, um, they thought I was good, so I got the, the job for that tour. And and, uh, and me and Bjorn, we we um, you know when you tour, when when you're on tour together, you need you need to get to know each other quite quickly because <laughs> you're stuck yeah. in a bus <laughs> twenty four yeah. seven. And, and me and Bjorn, we we found out very quickly that we both loved you know classic rock. We we started bonding over you know old Toto and you know Boss Gags and White Snake and you know all the good stuff. <laughs> And and um, and so so on that first tour we became friends and, and we everyone in the band hated us because we were on the back lounge listening to Toto and getting drunk uh, and, and we <laughs> and we decided like oh we need to start a classic rock band because no one is doing this these days and and and, um, and uh, I didn't get the job with Soilwork back then which was probably just as good I mean but. I eventually started, uh, became a member back in 2012, but me and Bjorn, we kept in touch and I played with the soil work on and off and when we started writing songs and trying to find the right people and we, I mean, Bjorn was friends with Charlie D'Angelo, our bass player, and, and you know, I met him too and started talking and it's like, and he's also a big classic rock fan. He listens to all kind of stuff. You, you always think about Charlie D'Angelo, it's like Arch Enemy and, you know, Merciful Fate and yeah. this big, this big dangerous guy in black but he he loves toto and you know he loves all kinds of cheesy pop from the 80s and you know. so it, and the other guys were also a friend of ours and it just you know but it took some time to like find the right people you can't just really pick anyone it needs to be yeah. some people who really loves this and really understands what we're trying to do and we were fortunate to find them eventually, so we started like rehearsing around 2010, I guess. Back then, both our gentlemen were, were touring bands, and I had just become a father and everything, so it was a bit messy. But we found the time to get together a couple of times, and you know, the chem chemistry was there. It's like a relationship, and a relationship. It's like sometimes yeah. the chemistry, chemistry is there, <laughs> and sometimes it just it's just dead. But with the Nightfight Orchestra, we started playing and. I had written some songs and it was like, wow, we just, it just works. We never had to discuss, you know, it's not like we ever needed to discuss like, oh, perhaps you should play more like this or perhaps you should, you know, change your approach. Because everyone just knew instinctly what, what we were trying to do. And it just, you know, one of those happy, happy moments. <laughs> <laughs> it's like falling in love almost, you know, when you, when you meet the right people and you just have the, that connection on a musical level. It's amazing, isn't it, for non-musicians out there. So everybody who listens to my podcast knows that I'm a musician, but uh, mm -hmm. for, for non-musicians out there, it's so difficult to articulate what it can be like being in a band with someone you don't get along with. Yeah, um, yeah it's horrible. And, and I mean, yeah. I guess you're in, in bands <laughs> with... Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and, and um, of course you can't get along all the time. I mean, me and Bjorn were very different in many ways and we, we fight a lot about stuff, but at the same time, we love each other and, you know, I see him more like a brother. At, at the end of the day, we always, we want the same thing <laughs> and then we just have different approaches to stuff sometimes and, and you know, and um, so you should be able to fight with that, but we've never had that toxic, you know, um, 
in both Sorok and Nitrack Orchestra, we, we, I mean, we all have differing opinions and we not, we're not always agreeing on, on everything, but we're always able to talk about it. It's, it's, but it's just like in a relationship, when you can't talk about things, you, it just becomes toxic and you can't really, you know, <laughs> you start avoiding each other instead. And, and um, uh, fortunately, I mean, we've been able to, you know, get around that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's just a hell of a bloody awful thing when you've got somebody in your band who isn't rowing in the same direction as yeah, yeah. the rest of the band or even you, especially if you're a band leader, you're a band leader in this case here, and uh, you can you can have people in the group and they're just white ant and they're just mm. so difficult to... And the, the just the lack of respect that can happen in bands is ridiculous. Yeah. There's no yeah. other environment like them except for families. No, 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 maybe an army or two, not enough, but yeah. Yeah, and and I don't know, I mean, I guess uh, the secret, it's it's always going to be like, if you like each other and have respect for each other as people and musicians and and you're able to to talk and you should be able to fight, you should be able to get angry about stuff, Mm. you know. (laughs) Yeah, because you're human, that's right, and you're just sorting things out, yeah, I know, it's it's like that, yeah. Yeah. But you had uh, you mentioned Charlie there, and, and I reckon I've spoken to um, – God, I'm having a shocker tonight. What's the singer of um, Arch Enemy's name? Elisa. Elisa White Glass. I've spoken yeah, to her. Know. Yeah, I've spoken to her about him, but um, apparently he's got a photo- photographic memory. He just remembers things. Is that true? Yeah, sort of. He, he, he's like, yeah, he's like an encyclopedia. Um, he, he remembers stuff. <laughs> So yeah, it's really yeah, it's really fun, you know. We when we uh, when we were, I mean we with an iPod orchestra we always record and produce everything ourselves and, and uh, it's for the last I mean probably for all the albums but it, it's for some reason uh, I always record his bass. It's a, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm always the engineer when he's, he's doing his bass parts and I always, you know, yeah. challenge him and, you know, and uh, we we come up with the most outrageous, you know, you know, Charlie, this isn't working. We need to listen to, you know, Pink Flag by Wire or, you know, the first <laughs> Gang of Four album or, you know, yep. <laughs> you know, we need to listen to Return to Forever with Chikoria. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and um, we take a break and then we have a drink and like, you know, and then we just start, you know, discussing obscure references and, uh, uh, and you know, it's, it's, um, it's a pleasure to, <laughs> he's, he's one of the funniest guy, guys around. Um, and we always have, the, you know, we have also, we also have a quite special relationship and, and you know, I'm, I'm a bit like that too. My mind is always a bit dizzy and, you know, um, yep. lots of stuff going on in there. <laughs> so the two of us, we feel. can get, yeah. yeah. What, what about the two Annas? Do they, the, their performance, I, I noticed on this album, Aromantic 2, probably more than the other albums. It's not that they were doing anything better. I think it's just that maybe it's the way you've, you've produced it, but I just think that their voices really shine this time around. So did yeah. you have a lot yeah. to do with the way that turned out? No, I mean it's. I mean it's 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 been a natural, you know. Bjorn always he 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 used to always do all his backing vocals himself, and and um, and um, when we did the last album, we were just like when they became full time members of the band, we were, had already started recording the last album, and and so I guess. Um, they weren't as involved from the beginning and, and with this album they were like we knew that they were going to be on the album so we sort of like gave them more space in a way you know um i mean but it wasn't like a conscious thing but obviously i mean that we've gotten to know each other better and we know um we know their strengths and weaknesses and you know you know where what you know the difference between the voices and who's going to work best where and you know and they were more involved in the beginning too so i guess the uh you heard more of them on this album because of that yeah it was well yeah it's it's a great response because i did notice it and, and i'm glad that there was some sort of a uh that there was a different approach if you like which sort of led to yeah, that because yeah. um yeah yeah so 
Do, do you sometimes feel, you know, I suppose in some ways I've asked this question, but I'm going to reframe it slightly. At, at some point, did it sort of switch and did you feel like you were the night flight orchestra guitarist in soil work or does it still feel a bit like sometimes you're the soil work guitarist in night flight orchestra, if that makes sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I totally understand uh, what you mean. Um, I guess... Um, Like when um, when I became, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever felt, I've always felt like the Sorbo guitarist and Sorbo working on the Nightflight guitarist and Nightflight. Mm. Um, because when I, when I joined uh, Sorbo work, uh, of course I was a new guy, but at the same time, um, I'd been playing with them on and off for six years and I knew their whole back catalogue and we, we have been doing like hundreds of shows together and and um mm. and um i was part of why i got the job was because Bjorn knew i was a good songwriter and you know that first album we did the living infinite um i mean i wrote probably half of the songs on that album mm. because I've, I've always been you know uh um, if I would if I wouldn't be allowed to write songs, I wouldn't have joined them because that's yeah. what I like. I mean, that's such a huge part of it for me. And, and I've always had, I've always been quite self confident as a songwriter and as a musician. I was like, okay, great that I can join you. And, and Bjorn knew that I was, you know. You knew me very well, and I knew the rest of guys as well. And, and I just started writing songs, and they seemed to like it. So, so, um, mm. but of course, it, it it's always like when you're the new guy. Um, um, but I never felt like I was the night or orchestra guitarist in sword work. I was, you know, the new guy in sword work. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but but of course, it, it takes a while to. Um, I mean, these days it's more like me and Bjorn were more in charge of the creative process and sort of as well. Um, um, because it's, you know, not because we have to, but, but it's more like we were the most, you know, we write the songs because the others didn't write that many, you know, they're not as proliferative. <laughs> um, and, but they all have loads of input on the actual production and stuff. And, and, um, uh, and Nightflight Orchestra, obviously, that's been mine and Bjorn's baby from the very beginning. But, mm -hmm. So that was always a bit more natural. But I mean, uh, with Sorg, it, uh, uh, it felt, I never felt, you know, um, like I was just, you know, that guy from Nightflight Orchestra. And especially since when, we, when I joined Sorg, Nightflight Orchestra was nothing. When we did our first album, no one really noticed. We got like a couple of interviews in some in a couple of metal ma magazines, but I mean, we no one we had no budget. We couldn't make any videos. We didn't have any shows or anything. Just a fun thing, and you know. yeah, yeah. Has there been obviously COVID? We've all been going through this for the last. Oh, it's almost two years now. Definitely a year and a half, but we're coming up to almost two years now. But um, has there ever been discussions, or has there ever been? a show or a gig where you've done both bands? Um, no, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't done it personally because, um, but we've done festivals for, where both Night Threat Orchestra and Soil Work has played, but then I've had a stand in and Soil Work because for various reasons, I mean, I had some health issues in the family and, you know, and lots of other stuff and it was a bit too much. I couldn't really, you know, um, deal with all of it at the same time. So, so um, there were a couple of tours and, and um, festivals where I had uh, a stand-in guitarist. Um, so I guess like the summer 19, um, we had a few festivals where both bands played, but I wasn't playing with soil work just for night flight because it was just too much right then for various reasons. But I mean, it was quite, quite interesting to watch soil work from the crowd. <laughs> you know? That's weird. Yeah, like, oh, 
those like were playing my songs and yeah but it was it was nice and then you know simon the guy who who was my Phil and guitarist is a great guy, and so and both bands are friends, you know. <laughs> so it was kind of nice. We hung out both bands and backstage, and you know, <laughs> drank beer in, in the sun, and you know, it was like a family gathering. So, so it's um, I mean, but it, that's you know, that's, that's how it is when you get older. You you, you know, life gets more complicated. Um, Indeed it does. So you have to, you have to like, but as long as you know, everyone, we all support each other, and and uh, you know, the only the only one who's never replaceable, I guess, is Bjorn. <laughs> but that's like with a whole. Need to it though now. I mean, you, there, you've established yeah. a dynamic that's been there for nine years. It's very hard to yeah. replace. Yeah. It. Yeah, but but um, but yeah. Um, and these days, with the when people aren't buying physical physical albums the way I used to or we used to, no one really notices who's on the album. To be honest, mm. they kind of recognize Bjorn, but otherwise, it's like to be, <laughs> you have to to be aware of that fact as a musician. Like people aren't really aware who's doing what, and that's fine in a way, as long as they like the music. That's so true. I remember I'm 43, so I'm probably a similar age to yourself. But remember yeah, when we yeah. were kids, you knew who played keyboards on the Candlemas albums. You just yeah. knew. You just got yeah. what was going yeah. on. Like a bit, yeah. these days, people just don't give a shit, which is I no. still care. I still find out. No, Wikipedia is there. It's actually, technically speaking, never been easier to find out who's played what. And no. and you talk, we talk about Charlie, for example. Like, I mean, how many bloody bands has Charlie been in? Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you sort of knew, but kids these days wouldn't. With all due respect to Charlie, greatest respect to the fella, love his work. Probably don't know who he is. No, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but that generational thing, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, so we'll come yeah. back on. Yeah, yeah but I remember it, it's just like when um, it's it changed quite quickly when I did my first uh, tour with with Sorwick. Then back in '06, it was still just on the verge of you know. The whole streaming thing wasn't really because then I actually people were like discussing this on forums and stuff like oh who's filling in for Peter now and who is he and you know yeah people were like oh I want to make an interview with you and on how it is filling in for Peter and you know <laughs> and nowadays I mean we could we could probably have fill-ins on <laughs> all kinds of positions and no one will notice as long yeah. as it sounds. <laughs> remotely similar to the album in, and, you know, <laughs> which is sad and, and but you know it's just like the old streaming thing and or the pandemic or whatever it's just inevitable and you can't do anything about it so it's no reason to you know <laughs> no no yeah, yeah. Have, have you got another interview next in two minutes no time? no it's sort of a familiar name oh look there he is <laughs> he's right there you can answer <laughs> if you want <laughs> hello viewers I mean, I'm doing a, an Australian interview. Hello. Hey, hey, Bjorn, it's, hey Bjorn, it's Andrew Mackay-Smith. We, we've had a mini chat, so you might remember we spoke the night before Ralph Santola passed away. Oh, yes, I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Interview right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. I, I wouldn't have answered it if it, wasn't, if it hadn't been you. <laughs> Yeah, but I can okay. I, I can I can call you later. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good, good okay. to chat, mate. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. There's always uh, there's a yeah. <laughs> I think who was I speaking to? I was speaking to uh, was it Anders in In Flames? One of the guys in In Flames, anyway. And I was talking to him about Chris Broderick. You know the guitarist oh. Chris Broderick, and he goes, oh. "We're talking about him. He's sitting next to me." <laughs> so I said, "Oh, well, say hello to him for me." And he goes, "Yeah, hello." So uh, yeah, that was that was very serendipitous. Is Chris Broderick in, in in Flames now? He did a like a fill in for them. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Yeah, God, he could definitely be in that band. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah, when Megadeth in, into Act of Denial, I think is the band, which is a brilliant band. He's just mm -hmm. just didn't catch on. Unfortunately, the buzz for him. I thought he had one of the albums of 2017, um, yeah. but um, then he found himself touring with um, 
I think he was in Arch Enemy too for a bit, wasn't he? Touring with them for a bit, yeah. There's yeah, might have been, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I know Jeff, Jeff Loomis a bit, and he's a real nice guy. Um, we met occasionally over the years. Um, How good is Nevermore? Have you seen it like the early and, and Sanctuary? Those Warrell Dane, my God, rest in yeah, yeah. peace. But my God, he's such yeah. a great vocalist, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's really impressive. So with with a wisp of the Atlantic, um, it sort of was released. I don't know whether this is nuclear blast fault or what have you, but I just felt it got no attention. And I know it's an EP, but you know you are soil work. So and yeah. every release is pretty is quality. So I just sort of thought that that was a release that was like boom out there and disappeared in some ways because I still listen to it. Yeah, I mean um, that that whole EP was my brainchild i wrote the whole thing beautiful well, it's, it a stunning, my, um, it's a stunning it EP, mate. I, uh, no thank you thank you uh, yeah i'm really proud of it and, and um I've, i have i've had this idea for a long time or this vision about like doing doing a really epic progressive track with sword work hmm. just because that's something people won't expect a band like us to do and and um um just to show 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 off the fact that we're quite you know we're able to do a lot of stuff that people you know they don't think of us as you know we're a quite versatile band actually <laughs> and yeah. you know like Sven's you know acoustic piano playing and everything there are, you know and and um, there are a lot of things that people won't expect from Solwerk and, and I always knew we had it in us to like do something really progressive and and you know. Uh, out there, um, and uh, but at the same time, we, we chose to call it an EP because um, I don't know. It, it's sort of like it took off the pressure a bit. You know, if 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 you say that oh, we're going to release a new album, and and it was um, a bit experimental and and um, something that we that we did just because we really wanted to, and something that I really wanted to try. Um, but well, at the same time, um, it would have been, you know, it, if you release it as an EP, you can, you know, people who are into, you know, getting a bit deeper, <laughs> um, they can, it will reach them anyway, eventually. And, and um, hmm. I don't know, and, and the, the label too, of course, it, it's, you know, they expect a certain thing from us and, and um, Spending loads of money promoting a sixty-minute progressive epic thing. <laughs> I mean, it might, it might, um, you know, it might be a success, or it might also just. But when yeah. you when you call it an EP, it's just like it's what it is. It's it's like uh, you know something that we do because we love it and we it's interesting and and um, it's it definitely inspired us uh, all of us I think and, and um, you know that's why we're still doing this because at least why I'm still doing this because I want to keep things interesting I want to you know hmm. develop as a band and as a musician and songwriter and, and um, you know we're working on our next album now which is going to be a, a proper album And but I think we've you know we've become closer and gotten to know each other even better as musicians because of that EP. Yeah. And, and, and some of the singles like Death Diviner is, is one of the most popular songs from, you know, Spotify and stuff. So the short songs are, uh, you know, so it wasn't a commercial failure, but, you know, if you want to dig deeper into, you know, yeah. sword work and, and you can always, you know, and if you think it's too much, then it's fine because you know we we do still play short songs as well. <laughs> I don't know yes. what do you think about the uh, uh, Wisp of the Atlantic thing. Oh, it's an album that I put on to help me go to sleep. So it's not that it, it's boring or anything like that. I just yeah. think it's vast. It's epic. I you know I do a lot of yard work and stuff here just to try to get the kids outside and away from bloody iPads and stuff, mate. And um, yeah. I I have a, a monster speaker set and I had that outside with that and you know so Bluetooth and I had it on and I noticed it wasn't it wasn't the sort of thing I could put on in the background because it's got those high highs and low lows sort of things with, with gaps <laughs> in between. Yeah. And I, and yeah. I thought oh this is an album I need to sort of stick stick on in the background but 
Then I did that yeah. when I was doing some study and I thought, no, it doesn't suit that either. So because there's some quite commanding bits to your point, intricate guitar lines and rhythmic rhythms and yeah. melodies. And, and it's an it's one of those bodies of work where I couldn't tell you the names of the song because I just put the songs on and I leave it. So mm -hmm. take that as another compliment because it's one of those things where you put it on and I'm not, it's not when, you know, there's a massive high point in the middle or the second track's the killer cut and then you don't worry mm -hmm. about the rest of it, which is very common to be honest with you. Let's face it. That's hence mm -hmm. the, because bands are writing things for bloody Spotify. And I get yeah. that they've got to do that, but you guys clearly don't do that. You're writing things and it's a, it's an extraordinarily unified body of work and and i just like the idea of a wisp of the atlantic you know it just feels a bit viking like you know i'm australian you guys are from sweden and we sort of still have that romantic view of you swedes and danes and yeah. norwegians that that there's a, you know there's that viking heritage there and we love that we, we appreciate yeah. that so it sort of brought me into that world a little bit you know sort of takes you yeah. away just for a moment yeah that's nice and that's actually that's really what i wanted to achieve like Mm. Um, I mean, I love I love writing short songs and catchy songs, and you know. But at the same time, it's personally I have always loved if you have the time to to you know just lie down with headphones and you know, listen to like Supper's Ready with um, with Genesis or like Gates of Delirium with Yes mm. or you know those epic tracks and and um, and I'm also really proud of. Uh, I We've done some epic songs. It's always me who wants to do the progressive stuff, but we've, we've done some long <laughs> tracks with Life at Orchestra as well, like mm -hmm. um, The Last of the Independent Romantics and Heather Reports. And, and um, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, when I'm lying there on my deathbed, I think those are the tracks that I'll be most <laughs> proud of. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's there for posterity's sake, to your point. I've had this, I interviewed yeah. Robin Ford yesterday and I said the same thing to him. Um, with, with yeah. his work, you know, because it is important that you take your time when you're releasing music that's important to you. It's extremely yeah. important that that happens, that it's a true and accurate reflection of your soul because it might take, I mean, who knows? Nobody's got a crystal ball, but 20 or 30 years, how many, I couldn't name check one now, but how many albums are emerging from the 60s, 70s and 80s that people are calling classics out that nobody had ever heard of back then is my point. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Speaking, yeah. You know. <clears throat> So let's let's go back to when you were a kid, when you were sort of 12 and 13. No, no doubt you're a smart fella, obviously, but, but you've got this this uh, medical specialty over here, heavy metal guitarist extraordinaire over here. Was that even conceived when you were that age? Well, I was, no. I mean, I was always, you know, quite brainy. I was... I was quite a lonely kid. I always I started reading when I was four and I always read loads of books and, you know, I had it pretty easy at school. Mm. So it was always in the back of my head somewhere that if I fail as a guitarist, I can always do something else. But, but, mm. but I mean, when I grew up, it was all about, you know, becoming a rock, rock star, basically. <laughs> Sounds pathetic, but, you know, I want to be a guitar hero. I wanted mm. to play in bands and then I... Um, so I went to music school and, you know, and I started, uh, I played in loads of bands and we got a record deal when I was like 19 and we, which was with Mike Varney, you know, Shrapnel Records. I do. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I didn't know yeah. that. There you go. Uh, we did two, two albums, uh, on a, a subsidiary label of his, which were a bit more like, you know, some sort of grungy thing. It was like back in 95. So that was what we were supposed to do back then. Yeah, yeah. It just bombed completely. And, and uh, I had to work as a guitar teacher and I hated it and, and I just gave up. So I, I went to medical school instead and gave up playing for a couple of years. And then I, you know, mm. soon after I got my um, MD and I was a PhD student and then I, you know, I got the chance to do soil work thing and all of a sudden it like things were you know it yeah you know, uh, grew from there so yeah <laughs> so it's a you know mm. but it's it's nice perhaps it's good perhaps i've been dead now if i had became a professional metal musician at 20. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, i'm happy with temptation. And, and, and uh, i enjoy being a doctor as well but it's, it's you know 
music is always going to be like the first I've always seen myself as a musician first and like then a doctor but, but I mean I really enjoy being a doctor as well and, and it's added a whole new dimension and, and uh, you know um, you know everything is as long as you like what you do and you know I was I really hated being a medical student and I hated having to do the internship and stuff because I knew really early on that I wanted to become a gastroenterologist and I did my PhD in gastroenterology and you know and I had to go through all the other crap but then I finally you know could specialize and you know just do the things I like to do which is mainly IBD and you know endoscopies and stuff and you know but it was a long journey <laughs> to get there. <laughs> Are you in the uh, the public system over there, or have you got your own practice? No, I work in the public system. I've, I've been working. I've never had my own practice. I've been working at a private clinic. I did that for like a year or so, but I still enjoy being in a hospital more. Like when you have the, the inpatient ward, and you can do the more. You know, you get the the most difficult cases, and you you um, you can do more like invasive endoscopies and get the mm -hmm. bleeding things and tr like all the dramatic stuff. That's what I like. <laughs> Sounds a bit morbid, but I mean, you know, yeah. I like the challenge of it. When you work in privately, you 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 can only deal with. You know, it has to be. It can't be too difficult, or or um, you can't have any emergency. You know. And I like dealing with the difficult stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah. In your opinion, though, um, is it is it a combination? It's probably a combination of lifestyle factors, I suppose. But um, yeah, I mean, it's something that I suffer with. So this is the question I have for you about it: Do, do emotional issues play a significant role in people suffering the condition? How do you mean? Like, like if you go through a lot of emotional stress. Okay, yeah. is an outcome that you can develop some sort of an IBD disorder such as Crohn's disease or colitis. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've, I've been, um, I've been, I mean, I'm still doing research, and I've been involved in, in some, um, you know, stress research too when it comes to stress and IBD. And, and I have a good friend who's like, she's the president of the European Crohn's and Colitis Nurses Organization. So, so she and her. Uh, me and her, we we've, we've done a lot of research together uh, on that. And, uh, personally, I think that I don't think that stress in itself can cause IBD. Um, I think it's it's more like, um, but it, it definitely if you, if you have IBD, it can definitely trigger a flare. Oh yeah, got you. And 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 and, um, and when and I do think on a personal level because it's when you work as a doctor, you you're supposed to be evidence based. Yes. And we have no we have no evidence that stress causes it. But I think if you have it, you need to have um, um, you need to have a sort of like a genetic predisposition in your intestinal immune system. To be able to get IBD, we know that you need to have some sort of mutation in your immune system in the bowel. And that, I mean, there are, there are like hundreds of different mutations and combinations of genes, but it's you need to have that predis predisposition and you need to have a certain bacterial flora. And then you have to have some sort of like external factor that triggers the first flare. And, and I've had loads and loads of patients that said like, oh, it started when my wife died or when yeah. I got divorced or, or, you know, when I went through depression or lost my job or whatever. So I, on a personal level, I do believe that stress can trigger the, you know, it can, it can you know, you have it, you have a... a predisposition to develop it and then stress might, I think we know that stress can trigger flares, but we don't have evidence for, for stress actually triggering the first flare or causing the debut of the yeah. IBD. But, but yeah. at the same time, you know, I've been working as a doctor for, for uh, I've been working in, in gastroenterology for since 2003 and, and you know, I, on a personal level, I do believe that, yeah, it's a combination of things, but in some cases, it's just very obvious that, you know, it was the trigger. And, and but like I said, it's really hard to, it's always really hard 
to make those. Sorry, I'm now going off on a <laughs> but, but <laughs> no, as a scientist, you know, you know, the reason why is because if you if you um, it's always easier to study people when they have a diagnosis. Like if you have uh, ulcerative you, colitis or Crohn's, then you you're included in various registers, and you can always like include people in the studies or trials. But it's it's much harder if you don't know whether a person will develop a disease or not. Then it's really hard. Then it's going to be a retrospective thing, and you never know. It's really hard to go back and you know sort of like measure the amount of stress that person had and, and also the time uh, the connection between time like when the stress when the stressor happened and when the disease debut happened so it's it's yeah. like we're probably never going to get the at least not in my lifetime we're probably not never going to get like the evidence but you know but i think uh, in certain cases, I'm, I'm pretty sure that stress can can like be the you know, catalyst. Yeah, I, I definitely felt that. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a situation isn't worth talking about within my birth family. So the family that I was born into, where I more or less had to stop speaking to them for a period of time, and then my father died, and amongst all of that as well, and wasn't able to go and see him and all the rest of it through that, and it triggered catastrophic outcomes. With that, yeah. you know, on top of that, I had a very stressful job as well, and I uh, almost yeah. died. Well, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. I ended up in hospital for eight days, and um, mm -hmm. because I started having organ failure as a result of it, and mm -hmm. I was on salazapran at the time. Probably no, of course you would, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was at I was I was travelling away from home because I was um, mm -hmm. working up north, up far north Queensland, and yeah. I wasn't bringing my medication with me, and. Um, yeah, it just triggered a collapse, basically, and I've sort of been. It, it got so bad, I actually had to quit my job. Yeah, and yeah. and I had, and that's what caused. I'm very happy with the way my life is now. Believe me, because that yeah. act is the catalyst, if you like, for me to um, take a, really assess things in terms of stress and how it was affecting the condition. And then I yeah. made a call in to become a journalist, which people would go, well, that's a highly stressful job. But I was more into writing as opposed to a lot yeah. of investigative journalism and all of the, the political... No, there, there's, a huge, there's a huge huge difference between, you know, positive stress and negative stress. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. Will, yeah, if it's positive stress, it can actually strengthen your whole being if you do something that's stimulating. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it depends on what kind of person you are. I mean, personally, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit hyper... Uh, I have a really hard time doing nothing. I get really, you know, I have a hard time living with my brain if it doesn't get stimulation <laughs> all the time. Um, mm. I'm like a quite depressed person unless I'm stimulated. Um, mm. And that's why I keep writing songs and doing stuff all the time. And, and uh, um, whereas some people get stressed, they need to have, you know, it should be, you know, but I mean, I, I know exactly what it's like experiencing negative stress too. And, and um, you know, so stress can be so many things. And that's also oh, why it's, yeah. you, know, you know, stress isn't, you know, it's, it's more, I think it's more meaningful to talk about life events. And, and also there's this how you perceive stress. It's this thing called perceived stress questionnaire, PSQ, which is like a much better tool, but... Um, you know, you've probably seen quite a few gastroenterologists and it's nothing that we as doctors, we, have, we don't have the time to sit down and, you know, really dig deep into that because once you meet a patient, then the disease is already there and you just have to, you know, do what you can to. Yeah. yeah. And also yeah. as a doctor, it's really hard as a doctor to, you know, you know, affect um the various stress factors in a people's life in, in a person's life. Mm. So that's why you know you tend to focus on you know medication because that's the only tool you have basically. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Well I take Pentas these days. Yeah. Yeah, Pentas yeah. has been a godsend, I've got to say. That's worked out um, mm. just just orally, you know. Um yeah. and it's yeah. um I mean that because of that, the other thing I don't probably should edit this bit out too, but um oh no, I don't have to. It's C B D oil. God, everybody takes C B D oil. I found oh, yeah. when I found like organic C B D oil, so none of this industrial shit that's starting to invade the market, but um 
you go down the road down here in northern New South Wales and there's a big, like, hemp grown community. Like, like, you go to this place, it looks like a typical hemp den, but then you'll see cancer patients and the like are just trying to get better. Yeah. It's all it is. Yeah. And uh, I've got to say, mate, I've found that, that hemp and occasionally activated um, tincture v- helps yeah. a lot. I've got to tell you, it's sort of, it's like if I'm operating it, you know, if I'm redlining it sort of eight or 9,000 reds per minute, it sort of brings it down to sort of five and six, I find. Yeah. And uh, that and these things, I have to take, uh, you can see that, uh, propranol, mm. propranol, um, uh, beta yeah. blockers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just find it's all linked. And if I'm doing a very stressful thing, like I, um, you sort of got to read, when you go through an event like what I went through, um, you've almost got to start over again with your health from the perspective that, I couldn't stand up and even do public speaking. I'd shake, and the like. It just went right to the core, and 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 it was almost like this this nervousness that never sort of went away. It was kind of an anxiety, but I, I guess I've, I'm very, I'm pretty lucky in that I've never been a depressive person. I've just always sort of if if something I've, I've got angry about things that happened in the family, if you like, and I often wondered if those things were the were the catalyst or whether it was. I think you're, you're of course you're the doctor here. You're, you're spot on. You got that pre. The condition could exist, and then you get a trigger, and boom, and then that's yeah. these emotional events just make it far worse. And um, yeah. so it all just comes down to lifestyle, and just occasionally having a drink to sort of bring your bring your spirits up and your blood pressure down a little bit. And doing mm-hmm. things like this, doing this, talking to people like yourself has been magnificent. Mate. You know, six hundred and yeah. something interviews into it, and I just love doing this. And and uh, I was. I, I remember talking to Bjorn about you being a doctor. I just didn't, of course, how would I know that unless I did my own, uh, how would I know that you had this specialty, which is a specialty that I need need to need maintenance on in the day to day, you know? So yeah. it's, uh, it's great to talk to you on that perspective. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's a very special group of diseases. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, um, if you're an, if you're, if you're going to be a good IBD doctor, you need to be a bit intuitive. Yeah. As opposed to like, like if you have a myocardial infarction or a stroke or an atrial fibrillation or, you know, um, you just, you know, you just follow like, uh, you know, you have the standard operating procedures, like what you're supposed to do. And, and but with, with IBD, it's always very, it's never that straightforward. And, and you don't have this, like the standard, you know, you don't have the standard, the, you know, the magic bullet that works in everyone. And, and, you know, and it's also very much, like you said, it's, it's also very much about psychology and, and, yeah. you know, the whole fact that it's for many people, it's really hard to talk about like, Oh, I have to go and like, you know, I'm shitting blood 10 times a day. And it's, it's, you know, it's not something you bring up in everyday conversations. And, and yeah. it's yeah. also a lot of people think it's a stigma and, and it also often, you know, you often get it when you're a young adult and it's a really sensitive age to begin with. And then you get that sort of crap on top of it. And, you know, it's, it's, and, and, um, and, and it's also, you know, finding the right medication and, you know, that also suits the life you're living. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a very stimulating thing to work with because there are no standard solutions. I, I have this inverted Asperger, like I, I like chaos. I like, you know, <laughs> I, 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 hate routines. I, I hate when things become, you know, um, repetitive and, and working with IBD, you never get bored because, you know, it's not just about the inflammation in the bowel. It's also about, you know, what person <laughs> does that bowel exist in and, you know, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's uh, you know, and I, like you said, it's uh, one one patient can like get this medication, and it's very good. Like, bam, everything is perfect. And you know, other people you have to like go through five, six different treatments. And uh, yeah, you know. so true. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? So the human body is a is an amazingly fascinatingly complicated thing. Yeah, you know. So absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Look, I'll let you. I'll let you have the last word here. Okay. Um, so we've talked about the music, and we've talked about your role there in your medical as a medical professional. But 
For you, mate, what do you hope the future holds? For me or for the world? Well, let's let's go with you, and then if you want to answer the second part of that, to, to the world. Uh, yeah, I mean, personally, I've had a horrible year. Uh, I've, I've gone through a divorce, and I've had a major major mental breakdown <laughs> with both depression and, and you know. Uh, various problems and I'm still recovering from that but um, um, and I'm still far from you know um, but I mean it's just you know life you know <laughs> you get a crisis every now and then in life and it's been really tough and you know I'm still under you know I still haven't got any proper diagnosis, but but I mean it's uh, yeah, it's been some sort of crisis reaction. It's been really hard, but at the same time I've been able to. Uh, um, these days I'm functioning again, um, but it was really difficult for a while there. And so right now, my own, you know, on a personal level, um, I'm happy to be getting. I'm feeling better and being able to do stuff again, and you know. But that's on a personal level, and, and um, otherwise, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, to me, the world is a bit depressing at the, at the moment, both with the pandemic and also with, you know, uh, the whole right wing movement across the world, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole dumbing down of society. There's a general, like, you know, when people, you know, there are so many strange movements out there, both, you know, racist homophobia, like the abortion laws in Texas and, you know, people mis mistrusting there, yeah. uh, science and thinking uh, and all this conspiracy, conspiracy theories that are able to like actually, you know, you know uh, people talking about fake news and you know, <laughs> it's just this whole dumbing down of, of, of society as a whole which makes me really sad but you know but it goes in cycles i guess it's going to be get better again eventually it's it's been like that for the past couple of hundred years <laughs> you get like the dark ages and then it gets um, come back on yeah 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 it's a, if i could remove one thing from our lives i've got to say it'd be social media because i'm seeing what it's doing mm -hmm. To society and just this, uh, people compare social media users who argue with each other to dogs behind cages, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's some truth in that, but it just it just shows this absolutely disgusting side of humanity that people will attack people that they don't know based on it based on 280 yeah. characters or less. Yeah, yeah, and that's I mean that's why I never um, I never read the commentary sections on social media. Mm. Like if you release something or, you know, I never read the commentary section, so I don't need to, I mean, the people I, I mean, if, if I meet people in person or like talk to them, then it's fine. But, but it, there are so many people out there who spend so much time just, you know, having an opinion. <laughs> if, if I like, if I hear a song, I don't like it, then I turn it off. <laughs> I don't, I don't spend like... 20 minutes writing about why I don't like it on a fucking commentary section. Because <laughs> who cares? I don't care if some random stranger from, you know, somewhere doesn't like my song. I don't care why he doesn't like it. You don't have to like it. It's fine. You have, you have <laughs> there are quite a, number, a, few, a few other songs you can listen to. So it's, it's like, um, yeah, I guess that's also part of the whole dumbing down thing. Like, why do you spend energy on that? Perhaps you can learn write, to write your own songs instead. <laughs> yeah, oh, look, I find that as a podcaster, I've, I've sort of got a bit of a rep as a subject matter expert on Cradle of Filth of all bands. Um, yeah. And I've interviewed most of the guys, the 90s era, so the uh, pre-2000 era, basically. I'm trying to interview everybody that's in that band for the purposes of writing a book. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. there's some of these closed fan groups that I joined just out of curiosity and I'll post an interview that I've done with Stuart or Nick Barker or something like that. Yeah. Oh, my fucking God. You know, the yeah. you get some, excuse me here, but some fuckwit from the Midwest of the USA or wherever they might be from, 
Nothing against yeah. people from the Midwest, the USA. I'm just picking an area. You know, <laughs> well, no, I could no, have said Sydney. Cool. I could have said Sydney. You know what I mean? But my but, point I mean, is, there are idiots everywhere. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. But just he was. He said something to me about. He picked up something that I'd said at the beginning of the conversation, and uh, a bit like, <laughs> and he missed the point completely. So I just sort of said, "Oh, hang on a second. And he goes, "Well, mate, he said something like." Uh, well, maybe if you can't take criticism, then maybe you shouldn't be doing this, eh? So don't do it anymore or something. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, it was because I don't get negative feedback. So when I get it, it's like, what the hell does that? You know, it's very strange. Yeah. I mean, you probably, I, mean, I can't see any evidence too, too often anyway of you guys getting a lot of negative feedback. But you just look at these people and think, so you're not a creator, you're not a doer, you're a reactor, and you're trying to tell mm-hmm. the creators and the doers that they should accept your fucking criticism. Because you're you, (laughs) you know, and uh, that part of me just, it gets angry at the moment, but then, you know, I've got kids and a mortgage and all the rest of it. I've got far bigger things to focus on. So I just tend to switch it off and move on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's been uh, it's been a wonderful chat. Um, look, I'll just check. Uh, I, I generally have conversations and release them on the podcast. But um, any of the um, things that we just talked about at the end there, do you want me to remove them, or are you have, happy for me to put things out there? No, it's fine. All right, no worries. Well, look, I hope to see you guys down here sometime again soon. God knows when we're going to get out of this bloody thing. But um, no, absolutely. Um, love your yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. Love it's the work solid. that you've been doing, and I just uh, yeah. yeah, it'd be nice to have a beer with you. When you come yeah. down, mate. Yeah. Super. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we might <laughs> we might release a few more things before <laughs> we're able to go anywhere anyway. So. I think that'll unfortunately <laughs> be the case because our yeah. borders here, you've probably been following what's happening here, our borders. I'm in a state where we're locked off from the other states in Queensland, so we're not even open to other parts of Australia, um, yet no. alone outside of Australia. So it's... Um, yeah, touring, mate. It's got to, it got to happen again sometime soon. We need it. It's the lifeblood of the yeah. heavy metal and hard rock fan. Yeah. Well, at least we're 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 going to continue to release stuff. I think it seems like people are enjoying the fact that both Night Flight Orchestra and so were were still productive. We're still like releasing stuff and being out there, and because people seem to need music now more than ever. And uh, some some bands are like they've been sitting around with a finished album for two years waiting for the chance to get out and tour and promote it properly. And but we were like, this might take five years and we're not going to sit around doing nothing. So we're going to continue to do, you know, great new music. And, and one day we'll have a hell of a problem trying to figure out the set list. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good problem to have, I think. So many killer yeah. cuts to choose from, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mate, uh, thank you so much again. Enjoy the music. Yeah. Love your guitar playing. Uh, please keep doing what you're doing. As I'm sure you no doubt will for a long time. And I look forward to the next conversation. Yeah, super. Thank you. Nice right. talking to you. Yeah. Likewise. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Take Thanks. care. You too, mate. Bye. Catch you. So that's a chat with the late, great David Anderson from Soil Work and the Night Flight Orchestra. What a tremendous fellow. He will be very sadly missed, it must be said. If you like that chat, there are plenty more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening to chats like that, well, I've written a book all about them. Click on the link in the banner on the website and you'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice and you can download a sample of my recent book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. If you do complete the purchase, hit me up because I want to thank you personally. And I've got a bit more to say about the book in a moment, but before we get to that, I want to bid you a fond farewell. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber 
and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words, uh, sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>